morning. It's great to be here this morning. Appreciate thank, you coming in. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us and, and making the, the trip over here. So um, if someone is not familiar with Cover 2 Resources, it really is a one-stop shop for um, people who are suffering from addiction, families who are going through the whole addiction process. And as our listeners know, we are dedicated to education and awareness on our show, at least biweekly, about the epidemic that is not only here in Wadsworth, but the state and across the country. So if you could talk to us a little bit about Cover 2 Resources, and then I'd like to get into why you started it. Yeah. Well, um, if we could, let's start w with why I started it and why my family sure. founded it. Um, in October 2015, we lost my son, Sam, to a heroin overdose. And at that point in time, we felt as though... He had been struggling with opioid addiction for a number of years. In fact, we traced it back to what we believed to be a party in 2007 where he got beat up and ended up in the ER. He was beat up so badly that um, they had to put um, three screws in his, in his face to, to kind of fix him up. Anyhow, um, he was overprescribed in a, in a big way pain pills, and very, very quickly, he became addicted. Um, when he couldn't get any uh, the prescription refills, he started buying it on the street, and the cost of it was, at that time, 80 to $90 per pill. So for a kid who's 21 years old, that real quickly becomes cost prohibitive. Um, but at that point, he was addicted. And when he compared that to the fact that basically the same chemical was available at $10 per bag, well, he quickly went to heroin, something that he was completely out of character. Some, he was an athlete. He was, he was, uh, he would, that's just completely um, not Sam, who he is. And, you know, for, for us, we didn't understand the disease. We didn't understand what he was going through. And looking back on it, at that point, that just illustrates the fact that it is a mental disease whereby his brain is hijacked. And that's what happened. So um, fast forward back up from 2007 to um, 2015, you know, October, we, we felt as though everything was covered. We felt as though he had the support that he needed. And in fact, he was doing great at that point. His, his job was going really, really well. He was the, the lead salesman for the office. Um, he had a, a girlfriend, Danasha, that just dearly, dearly loved him. Uh, the two of them were, were really in love and they were expecting their first. Um, so, for whatever reason, on the morning of Friday, uh, October 23rd, um, he, uh, he kissed Denasha goodbye. She went off to a little church retreat, and um, Sam went to work, as usual. Uh, but midday, he called off, told his, told his boss that he wasn't feeling real well, needed to go home. And um, don't know why, but he... Maybe it was rewarding himself because everything was going well. Who knows? But he texted his guy and got a hookup. Um, that was about 12.30 in the afternoon. And that was it. They found him the next day in his uh, game room. Uh, and he was, he was gone. He, um, the heroin that he got was heavily laced with fentanyl. And, and that was that. We as a family were just, we were devastated by that and we just didn't expect it. After going through two uh, trips to uh, rehab where each time he built and, and learned a little bit and, and seemed to be doing well, to have that happen when everything seemed to be going in the right direction was, was uh, it's an understatement to say it was devastating. So, what we realized was how little we knew about the disease as a, as a family. 
what we realized is um, how, how difficult it is to recover from heroin addiction, opioid addiction, and how it is a brain disease and it takes the will of the individual and a lot of support to make that happen. So um, I, this was, was an essay question, wasn't it? Yeah, no. it ac no. <laughs> actually, no, this, this is great because stories are about people and, and I just believe that your story will help someone that's listening now. So by all means, well, and you know, and you know, part of that too, it, it has to be. It's, and again, you can t you you take a lot away from it. You take frustration, you take education, uh, awareness, and and a different direction to look. You know, he had, you know, and again, just hearing your story here in the last two minutes, you know, he had everything that it took to recover. He wanted to recover. He was in treatment. He had family support. All of those external indicators were there, and and. And you know, without those, you're on a you're on a road to failure anyway. But that that had to uh, again be very, like you said, shocking because it it appeared that the road to recovery was there. But that's probably an indication of how strong the addiction that 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 gene or whatever it happens to be, medical or whatever, really is. Well, um, after you know, after Sam passed. We, we went on this journey. We felt as though we didn't have the education that we needed. And, and you know what? Our mission now is to pass that along to other families. And maybe, maybe it's going to make the difference in, in a life or two out there. Um, there's just so much that you need to know. But I, I tell you, there's one big profound thing that I feel like this last year came out of it. And looking back, who knows if it would have made a difference, but it could have. It could have. And so this, this I, I like to use a, um, um, a little metaphor for recovery. When somebody decides, and, and in our case, I'll, I'll go through this, but um, in, in detail in terms of what it meant to us, but first of all, when someone decides to go in to get help for this, and, and they want to go into treatment, they want recovery. Um, they're making the decision that, in essence, they want to climb Mount Everest. And when you think about it, climbing Mount Everest, we all know what an overwhelming challenge that is, it's huge. You know, there's, there's uh, just over 4,000 people that have ever made that ascent because of that. And, and those people, not even one of them, could have done that alone. They all took a big team. Why did they take a team to do that? Because there's so many different things they had to manage, right? You've got your gear, you've got all kinds of gear, you've got different coats, different shoes, different, you, you name it. More than 85 different elements that have to be managed. One person can't do it at all. It takes many, many different people to make that ascent. You need a team on average to make that climb of 13 people for just one person to make the ascent. And I believe that recovery is much the same. The fundamental difference is now you're not doing it because, wow, this is a great challenge. Their life depends upon it. Think about that. Imagine that. If you had to climb Mount Everest, you had to do it because your life depended upon it. Wow. So. You, when, when you consider that, you consider the, the only way, really, that, that I know of, after talking to many, many people about this, people that are successfully in long-term recovery, the only way that they've been able to be successful is surrounding themselves with a team, with a team. And the ones that seem to be more successful have more of a team, more people that they've surrounded themselves with. What's the team? Well, first and foremost, those peers that are further up the, the mountain, the so-called mountain, um, than they are. The people that have already experienced that, really, really important. The coach, really important. Recovery coach, sponsor, spirituality, going to meetings, all of, all of those things. Now, why for us is, is this so important to, to share that? Because 
looking back on it, when Sam was going through this, um, he, he and I talked about, you know, where he was in, in his recovery and what his, you know, I'll call it now, I didn't call it at the time a team, but now I, I relate to it as a team. You know, how his team looked. So, and because I heard Because typical back. addicts lose a lot of friends and family members along the way. People tend to drop off from supporting them, at least in, in my experience. I feel like, is that what you're saying? Well, what I'm saying is, absolutely. And um, in this case, we talked about Sam's sponsor. And, you know, I asked him, well, okay, how are things going with that? Well, you know, he had him for a while, but then, you know, just they weren't kind of clicking and everything. And, and so... The sponsor, well, they, they kind of lost touch, and, and now he doesn't have a sponsor, but it's okay because everything's working out fine, you know. He's, he's got things under control, and I bought that. Hmm. That's, a, that's a clear sign. Yeah. Well, the next question is, well, Sam, how about the meetings? What about the meetings? You going, going to your meetings? You know, what's happening there? You know, you meeting other people, other peers? Um, you know, no, you know, those meetings, I, I really, I feel like I don't need them. You know, I, I, it's, it's, I'm doing really, really well. And you know what? As a dad, I heard what I wanted to hear. As a dad, I really thought that um, I'm playing old tapes. You know, I've known Sam my whole life. I, you know, I, I know him through and through. And so I'm, I'm being dad. When he As said a, those things before, they were true. You know, yeah. yeah, about other things in life. But when he made those statements uh, about this or that schoolwork or this or that, they were true. Yeah. But now it's a different world. Now, as you know, at that point, I'm saying when when I'm talking with him and, you know, he's struggling with recovery, his mind isn't recovered yet. You know, your, your mind, the pink cloud, you know, that can take 18 months to go away. Long, long time. 18 months. So, you know, it's, he wasn't the son that I, you know, knew and loved. And, and the whole point being, these were warning signs as far as his team. His team, you know, these skills that he learned in each, um, each time that he went in, in, into a program in, in rehab, each time here he went locally, and, uh, and, and then the second time was down in Florida. Each time he learned these skills, put together a team, and then it eroded after that. That's really, really important to stay on that. This is a good segue into quick response teams, which I know yeah. that you're heavily involved with. And now, are, are you the, I know Coleran, I don't know if I'm saying that right, is it Coleran? Coleran. Coleran, so yeah. thank you. Coleran started yeah. mm -hmm. this, but were you behind this as well? Because I know that you heavily support a quick response team, and I know that Wadsworth is working very hard right now to implement a quick response team. So can you tell our listeners all about that? Absolutely. So um, let me fast forward to kind of set that up, if you will, with our first initiative. Our first initiative with Cover 2 was cover two resources was to do a series of podcasts podcasts <laughs> um, and I call them the PPT podcast series that's people places and things making a difference in the opioid epidemic and um, we did that to pass along the education and uh, that we didn't have for other families and communities for that matter so we reached out and just began interviewing people um, and and putting them out there on, on the web, and you can download it through, you know, your, your favorite podcast source. Um, anyhow, we, uh, last summer, it was last August, in fact, my sister brought to my attention a USA Today article about Cincinnati. And you may remember, in, in August, Cincinnati had a, just a horrible, horrible overdose problem. In uh, a two-day period, they had an unbelievable number of people that overdosed, and, and um, they, that was the first time that we really heard in mass of carfentanil. Um, so this article talked about that, and then in a very small little blurb, it talked about this community within the Cincinnati area, just north of Cincinnati, the community of Coleraine, and how for them, overdoses were going in the opposite direction. In fact, in fact they had a program in place that 
where they had year over year a 35% drop in overdoses. So think about this. You've got that whole area is, is just, uh, it's, hor it's kind of blown up in, in terms of um, overdoses. And yet right there in their community, it's going in the opposite direction. So I reached out to them and met a gentleman by the name of uh, Dan Malloy. Dan was a safety director uh, at Coleraine Township, and he told me about what they did. He said, Greg, we just got tired of doing the same thing over and over and over again and seeing no results. So what we did was we put together a cross-functional team. The cross-functional team consisted of a fireman, police, and social services. Each week, one day, we go out in the community and we knock on doors of all the people that have overdosed in that last week. And we offer them a packet of information and share with them, here's how we want to help you. Here's the help that's available. Let's get going. What can we do? So at first, as well you can imagine, this is policemen knocking at their door. They just, you know, they're, this is kind of their little underworld. So, you know, people didn't answer the door. Right. But once the word got out what was going on, people started opening doors. And people started, when they saw that, they, they would break down and cry, in fact. And it also it changed the culture in the, you know, police, fire, EMS. Um, community. They, yeah, in the community, exactly. Because now they were making a difference with that 35% drop year over year. So as of July, they had the program in place for one year. Also, 80% of the people that they talked to, they got help for. They got them help, 80%. So as I talked to Dan and we did our podcast, I thought, wow, this, we need to bring this to Northeast Ohio. What can we do? Dan, what can we do? And he said, let's do a workshop. Oh, well, great. Okay, fantastic. So December 9th, we brought them up for a workshop in Summit County. And we had 75 people participate. This was police, fire, and social services from 15 different count, or excuse me, 15 different uh, communities uh, in Northeast Ohio. And this was, it was a half day program and it was all about how to start your quick response team, how to do it in your community. And it was kind of soup to nuts, so to speak. Um, I'm really happy to say that now we've got to believe the, the count is seven communities that have embraced this and, and started to take off with this program. And, and it, it's really exciting to see. We've, uh, uh, we recorded the whole thing. We did this, by the way, in green. And um, the whole community just embraced the program in a big way. Uh, and they were the first to say, yep, that's we're, we're in. Um, we want to do this. And so they hosted the workshop and we recorded it. And so now we've got the workshop. Uh, we broke it, the videos down into really easy to digest sections. They're all out there along with all of the documentation. So you can find that at cover2.org. And if you go and look under the top um, tab that's called programs, you'll see that's the first program, quick response teams. Now, of course, these quick response teams cost money, I believe, about thirty-two to 34000 a year. Is that correct? So, um, it's And my next question was going to be, how, how do communities, I know we have people listening now who are very interested in quick response teams in their communities, but right. funding sometimes is a hang-up. Sure. So, um, the way that... Uh, Dan and his team did it was this was resources that they had on staff and so what they calculated their cost to be is somewhere in the neighborhood of about 54,000 per year and and that is taking into account those people that they're going to use for that half a day is what it is per week so it's people that are already there and um, Overall, I don't have an exact dollar amount on this, 
But it's a really compelling economic argument when you consider the fact that they deploy people that they don't have to hire. They, they def deploy resources that they have anyhow. They use them in a little different way. Um, and yes, they, they are spending, you know, um, they're, they're, they're paying the employees and everything, and so they're, they're spending cash on this. But when you consider the fact that now they don't have these runs that they had before, they, they actually they end up saving quite a bit when you, when you consider all of the costs that are saved as a result of this. Uh, we are speaking with Greg McNeil, 97.1 Wadsworth Community Radio. And, of course, uh, Greg, is, as he's mentioned a couple times, here is with Cover 2 Resources. And, uh, again, with the podcast and everything else here, uh, we are talking. Uh, we had Originally, we were introduced uh, uh, to you by Kirk uh, Kurswadi, uh, from on the uh, Drug-Free Coalition. He was at maybe one of the seminars and it sent uh, an email to us and it said, hey, you guys really ought to talk to Greg, and and, and so the, the rest is history. But that's that's how you ended up in your seat here. Someone uh, on our drug coalition uh, at one of the seminars said, "This this you you need to talk to this gentleman." So, well, I found you in the paper when you were talking about the quick response teams in green, and so um, at our January meeting, I I said, "Guys, we need a quick response team here." And one of the other gals on our coalition was saying the same thing to our safety director. So we simultaneously we're championing for this um want to go over a couple of your podcast series if i can because i've been looking them up online um a couple of them that really stick out to me of course the one where you talk about overcoming tragedy and giving back um want to get to that if we could but first um over prescribing seems to be a big issue i, I told you a little story about myself um just uh, two C-sections, you know, the hospital wants to force the opioids on me. And I, I, I said, no, I never took them. You know, I can, I did it with Tylenol, ibuprofen. And I only say that because I even got a prescription sent home with me. And that really frustrated me after I explained to them why I didn't want this. And they still gave it to me. Of course, I didn't fill it. But I think that's still something I'm, I'm told that hospitals are starting to crack down on this because originally they were told they need to treat pain. But those pain pills didn't come with any, by the way, this is very addicting by the FDA. So either they didn't know, they didn't say, whatever the case. Well, we now know that they are addictive. And so I wanted to talk to you about, we know that overprescribing can lead to addiction, but what are some alternatives then to the opioids? Can you talk a little bit about that? Can you talk about um, alleviating pain without opioids? I think that you did an interview with someone on that topic. I did. In fact, um, what we found was over in Patterson, New Jersey, there's a health care system called uh, St. Joseph Healthcare. And um, a Dr. Uh, Rosenberg there created a program called ALTO. And that stands for Alternatives to Opioids. And the concept behind his program, and, and by the way, um, St. Joseph Healthcare has the busiest ER in all of New Jersey. So very, very busy. They see over 300 patients per day. And so what happened was they decided that they wanted to really make a point, take action, and kind of change, uh, change the culture once again. Um, in their ER. And so what they did was they did exhaustive research on all of the alternatives to opioids that could be used in the ER. And then all of the 78 uh, attending physicians were taught all of these uh, procedures so that they could only prescribe opiates as a very last resort. And the result was they started this program a year ago, January, and the result has been a 50% reduction in opioid prescribing practices in the ER. And here's the interesting thing. Um, what happened was you have people that are, you know, drug-seeking, you know, folks that come into the ER, people that... that are addicted and, and they're you know trying to in essence game a system so that they um, so what happened was they now don't go to that ER they go down the street the uh, uh, Dr. Rosenberg mentioned that 
um, he had someone who runs the uh, a, another health care provider right down the street from him call him and say, Whoa, you're sending people, what's, what's going on here? And so kind of interesting. So the other thing is the soccer moms that are uh, concerned about, you know, their, their son or daughter gets injured and concerned about exactly what's going to be prescribed. They bring them there now to St. Joseph. Yeah. Safer. Yeah, that's that's pretty incredible. Which, which, which again, th those statistics just show how much of the problem is an overprescription. Uh, people sure. that, yeah. right, right. It, it's not just a uh, a kid or, or an adult at a party that decides to try something. It's 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 being uh, you know here. You, and again, you know, the FDA they approved everything way back. You know, we, we were talking about this before you came in. Things are approved, and you figured, oh, you know, it's got the government seal of approval on it. It's been tested. It's been vetted. It's safe to take. Not true. Not yeah, necessary, and yeah. you know, there's another thing here, and that is, we've been raised that the doctor's always right, right? Doctor's orders, in fact, and you right? can trust. Right. Trust judgment, your doctor. Yes. Education, sure. all the way vetted through. Sure, I, you're right. So we've put them up on a mantle there. But the reality is, in the healthcare system, we all need to be our own advocates as well. And we all need to, we know ourselves and our, our family best. And so while you can get a recommendation for a prescription, well, well, you can be prescribed something, that doesn't mean that you have to fill that entire prescription. That's right. You, you're the judge. You can be the, the advocate. In fact, you have a helper there also. And, and we don't use them as, as the helper, but your helper can always be the pharmacist. Right. Ask your pharmacist. I mean, we did a podcast with a pharmacist from the Portsmouth area. And, um, uh, you know, so he's been the worst through the worst of the worst of this. That's kind of the epicenter, they say, of, you know, the opioid epidemic. And anyhow, he shared that that is one of the one of the roles that he really enjoys about his job is helping advise and being that extra set of eyes to look at the prescription and, and say, well, you know, yeah, you, you, you could maybe do less here. You, you don't necessarily have to do all of this. How about if you're prescribed 25, why not start with five? You know? Right. You might not need those five, right? Exactly. Right. Yeah. So we all have to advocate for our own health care, the health care of our families. And, and that's kind of an attitude that, that of, you know, unquestioning here it's prescribed and therefore it's, it's right and it's best, et cetera. Um, it, that's something that now in this day and age has to be scrutinized. You know, anything that you're putting into your body has to be scrutinized. If I may, I want to ask you about one of your other podcasts, genetic testing. Mm -hmm. It's something that is on my husband and I, uh, my radar. Um, although I'm not even sure why we are even thinking about it when we know both of our family histories, um, there, there is addiction that's deep rooted. Mm -hmm. um, may I ask if addiction runs in your family or was this something that um you know you you just didn't know was there and the opioid just just you know triggered that so um i would say that yes on on both sides there is some addiction in the family is it one of those things where you say long history no not at all but okay. yeah there's definitely some addiction in my family what do you what do you know about genetic testing through you know your research and your your interviews and what would you say to someone like me who's mm -hmm. on the fence about it? Let me tell you why I'm on the fence about it. A, I already know we have um, addiction, like I said, that's deep rooted for both sides. What would it do to me? I don't know. I, I don't really know how genetic tests come back and and with the information that I'd be given, how would that impact me? I don't know. You know, would I assume that, oh, my gosh, of course they can't say, yes, your son has the addict gene. There's not, I guess, so to speak, a gene, but there are different factors that play into that from what I understand. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I'm on the fence because I, I don't know how that would impact me. Would it change the way I raise my son? Would it change anything that, that we're doing, I, I don't know. And so I, I'm always trying to be enlightened on the topic. Yeah, 
Um, Tina, I found that topic very interesting myself when I, I discovered it uh, midway through this, this journey, if you will. Um, so last summer I met at the RNC of all places in Cleveland. Uh, I met Sam's uh, a physician from when he was a young boy. His physician had a family practice, has a family practice in Hudson. Um, and Dr. Molesky was, uh, is now, uh, specializes in addiction and addiction recovery. And so her practice, you know, as, as uh, she and I got to talking, it, it was just a, a natural for us to do a, uh, a little bit of, uh, do a podcast together because I really wanted to learn for two reasons. Number one, she told me, you know, obviously she's got the history with Sam, but number two, she told me she likes to start off her, whenever she gets a, a new patient in, she likes to do genetic testing with them as a first step. And the purpose of the genetic testing, it's, it's not that it'd be nice if you could find out if you had the quote-unquote addiction gene, but that's, that's not the purpose of, of this test anyhow. I don't, I don't know if there is a test that would show up an addiction gene. But this test, what it does is it tells you how your body processes drugs. Okay? Okay. So you learn how, you know, if I, if I take this drug versus that drug, how is my body going to react? Because everybody has a, a little different um, makeup in terms of how they process. And so why is this, why is this important? Well, it, it's really important because you may find that you're, you're intolerant to some things, you know, to, to some medications. And, and so it gives you kind of a nice baseline to, to learn about that and, and learn about how, you know, how going forward, having that knowledge, um, how best to, you know, the doctors to best medicate you. See, that, that whole arena is just so fascinating, yeah. isn't and it? I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump back to our previous com, uh, conversation about the, uh, the, the medication and prescriptions. Uh, someone that's listening had, had sent, sent a, a little statement here. It said that uh, they tried to cut back on their meds, but the insurance wouldn't pay for it unless they got the 90-day supply. So in, in, in this case here, he just said he tried, you know, tried to cut back and not get his, he said, but the insurance, it was a 90 day supply and that's how it was set up. And so you, you have people that are fighting that also, evidently, which is. Uh, so um, it comes back to if there was a problem there, I would expect that he wouldn't have an issue with that. He's just trying to be responsible. Right. Correct. Right. Okay. Correct. Exactly. Right. right. So so then it comes to. Okay, so the exposure here would be with someone else getting the medication, I would, I, I would think, the concern. So keep it under lock and key, and I'll also dispose of what you're not going to use. And that becomes very, very easy. You've got disposal uh, locations where drop boxes, you can bring it to that. Um, and you've also got these little disposal pouches. Um, what do they call those? I know. I can't think of it. They're purple Detera, bags. Yeah. Something like that. Yes. Just add yeah. water, add water, zip it up. I mean, you, yes. you can dispose it in the trash, correct? Exactly. I have yeah. one at home. Really good. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and they give them out at Acme, and, and Acme's been a great supporter of that. And they're free. Yeah. They're free. Yeah. They provide them with uh, prescriptions, don't right. they? Yes, they and, do. And right at Wadsworth City Hall, real quick, too, there's the boxes right here that you could drop off uh, in any un in, un you know, uh, prescriptions here, too. So. Yeah. <clears throat> so, in a in a nutshell, um, there, Cover Two has many resources. You have a plethora of information on your website. Um, obviously, this is in your son Sam's honor and to help save a life, or hopefully even more than that. Um, tell us all about why Cover Two then exists. What you can find on the website. I know we talked about you can find the demo and resources for quick response teams. You can find you have 70 plus different podcasts from various different people from around the U.S. that you talk to that can provide information. Um, you want to be the one-stop shop, right? Well, <clears throat> uh, honestly, I think that that's really, really ambitious. I, 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 you know, there's so much to cover. Um, what, what we really want to be is an educational resource where um, people can learn 
about many, many different facets of this. We're never going to be the, the ultimate source, but hopefully we'll be a really great start for them. Um, so families that need additional education, if it's not out there as far as podcasts are concerned, there's something that you want to learn about, uh, let us know and, and get in touch with us and, and maybe we can help with that. And, and maybe if you're thinking it, maybe there's other families that think about what about this area? Could you do a podcast on that? Yes, we'd, we'd love to. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing is that um, we're going to continue to bring back, as we learn about programs that are working elsewhere, we're going to continue to bring those back to Northeast Ohio. Um, the first program we've talked about, the quick response teams. Our second program that I'm really excited about is Drug Free Clubs of America. Drug Free Clubs of America is a uh, incentive-based school club. So you found a chapter in your high school and the kids voluntarily decide to join. So it's, it's not a mandatory program. This is a voluntary program. They voluntarily agree to random drug testing. So to get into the program, they take a drug test, and then throughout the year, they take random drug tests, and uh, a portion of them, not all of them. Um, and in exchange, they become card-carrying members. They take these cards you know, their ID card for Drug Free Clubs of America out into their community. And so for the businesses that decide that they want to participate and help with this, they'll offer discounts and, and, and you know, incentives for the students, rewarding their good behavior, rewarding actually their good choices, I mean to say. And, uh, you know, it, it goes in some communities all the way to the point of if they present the card, it automatically entitles them to an interview in the summer when they're looking for a summer job. You know, it doesn't guarantee that they get it, but, right, but you know, a lot of the businesses are like, hey, amazing. I'm all in you, for this. You at least Let's get a seat this. at the, it get, guarantees you a seat at the table anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah which hey, is really jobs cool. Jobs are getting competitive, so that's, I mean, any leg yeah. up you can get. That, Speaking of, on the resume, it looks fantastic on the resume. Leadership, what, yes. Leadership, that's, uh, you're, you're just... You're throwing these softballs to me one after another. Are you that's, ready? You're ready. That's, that's a really, swinging. really good point, the leadership aspect of it. I think that that's the thing that I like most about Drug Free Clubs of America because um, we, we spoke earlier about how huge this problem is. And, and we need a sea change. We need to grow leaders. We need this, the up-and-coming generation to uh, take the bull by the horns, so to speak, and become leaders on this and, and change this. And that's part of the reason that it's going to take a while for this to happen because you don't build leaders overnight. You don't go down to the store and buy them. You have to build them. It's a character building thing. It's an education thing. So that that's why the... the and the, it's the, a team effort, right. which is what you talked about in the beginning. Right. So, and that's the neat thing about Drug Free Clubs of America is in the schools, the, the students lead it. So you get student leaders for each chapter that are there determining what those benefits are going to be right there in the school. Could be a special parking spot for Drug-Free Clubs of America that has a nice little sign on it. It says Drug-Free Clubs of America right next to the building. The kids that walk in every day, what do they see? Drug-Free Clubs of America parking spot. Because let's be real. I was lazy then, and I wanted the closest yeah. spot. I remember <laughs> yeah. vying for, like, oh, please give me one of the closest spots. It, yeah, so it could be a high great value. Setting. Right. High value at that age. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So that's really neat. And, and then, of course, the big thing that it gives them is another reason to say no when they're, you know, faced with that at a party. You know, it's not just say no now. Well, I could get tested. Could get tested. Exactly. Yeah. I've come this far. Look what I look, look what I'd be giving. You know, look right. what all the work that I'd be throwing away. You know, and and I have to say that uh, the other night at our the Wadsworth Drug Free Community Coalition our meeting, uh, the the, uh, the packet for the, the 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 club was passed around. So the schools are look at Wadsworth City Schools are looking at that right now. And again, we were just there at the meeting, and I was able to page through it. Of course, I couldn't you know, at the meeting couldn't read the whole document. But yes, that uh, that uh, that paperwork is in our hands good 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 That's so great. something important to to note um, about the program is you know a, a, a lot of people are a little concerned about the cost of it so let's just put that out there it costs 
$67 per year per student who is enrolled in this, $67. And that covers everything, reports, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what's, what's really important about this, so it's a really low, because it includes all the drug testing and everything else and the medical help. Um, but that bill doesn't become due until the end of the year, all the way to the end of the year. So let's take a look at this next school year. Right now, in these two months, so the month of, I'll say, um, March and April, is when you finalize your organization if you decide that you're going to do it for September 2017. So need to get it done by the end of April, okay? The, the paperwork and organization of it. And then next fall, you roll the program out. You do it all year. In June is when the bill becomes due. So what's that mean? So it gives us plenty, any community, plenty of time to get the Rotary Club, Kiwanis, other civic-minded organizations involved. And, and I, I think that that's, um, that support is going to come for communities that get behind this. I, I, I believe that. And your time horizon to make that happen is a pretty, pretty big one. And it's still proofs in the pudding. It's like it, it's not, you know, go ahead and, and make a contribution and we'll see what we can do. Look what we've done. Yeah. Support what's already in place. You know, point. build it, build it, and we build it and they will come where well, you're building it. Right. And now there is something there for people to see what they're putting their money into. Yeah. That works. Yep. That works, that right. Works. Yeah. I want to ask you two last things before we, we wrap up. The first is I see you have these live free, um, like they look like poker chips. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about them? And it looks like it's Mount Everest. I'm just going to guess <laughs> it's on that poker chip. That's exactly what it is. It's um, this uh, on the back of the, uh, the poker chip. At the end of when I go out and give a presentation, at the very end, I like to conclude with when you go into recovery, it's, it's like saying, deciding that you want to climb Mount Everest, only your life depends upon it. So I've got this poker chip that has a picture of a mountain and climbers on it, little silhouettes of climbers. And I like to give that to the people that are there in attendance that would like one. I offer it to them and ask them to put it in their pocket. And then when you meet someone, that you want to inspire, take it out of your pocket, give it to them, let them know you're on their team. They need to get that message. The more we put out that message, and, and you know, the, uh, the more they know, the bigger the team, the better. And the more that they, that they understand that we're gonna turn the tide on this in terms of the stigma. You know what, this is a brain disease. It's a chronic disease. You know, we understand what you're going through. Uh, let's set aside the shame, et cetera. Let's pull together and make this happen. So that's the I purpose of the chip. I love it. And the last thing I want to chat with you about is a well-known author is going to be coming to town in April. Can you tell us a little bit about the author and this book and how this came about? Yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> I've been um, working very closely with the uh, Summit County Opiate Task Force and uh, a number of uh, members from the task force, including the Summit County ADM Board, the Akron Library, they've been super on this. And uh, uh, let's see, who else do we have? We have, oh, Breaking Barriers, Hope is Alive, the Bornsteins, fantastic, really big supporters of this. Anyhow, um, Summa Health has also been involved in this, working with us. We've had a, 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 just a great team working uh, for the last couple of months on this project to bring Sam Quinones, a best-selling author of Dreamland, to town. For those of you that aren't familiar with Dreamland, it really does a fantastic job of profiling how we got into the crisis that we're in today, the opioid epidemic. And it's interesting, the read, if you haven't read it, it's a fascinating read because the epicenter is Portsmouth, Ohio. And much of the book uh, takes place in Portsmouth and it, it talks about how uh, pill mills really are a big part of this. And then it brings in the Mexican connection and how they had a completely different business model, more like a pizza delivery business model. And they descended on that community and many others 
uh, across the United States, but most notably Portsmouth, and turned this, this from a prescription pill uh, epidemic into ultimately the heroin uh, an opioid epidemic that we see today. So he, he's fascinating. If you've, if you've never heard or read the book, um, I encourage you to do so. And if you have an opportunity to come out and uh, participate in one of our programs on April 12th, we've got 12 community programs that Sam will be appearing in and participating in. One is kind of a little more geared towards health care, and it's going to start at 7 in the morning, so a little early but not early for the two of you. That's right. Uh, but <laughs> otherwise, yes. Um, so Summa Health is going to sponsor it at the um, uh, Firestone Auditorium, and we're going to have a panelist, several panelists there to, to discuss leadership in uh, community leadership making a difference in the opioid epidemic. Um, next, this will be a kind of a bonus Akron uh, Roundtable where the um, Sam will be doing a, a very short speech, and then from there, a Q&A at the Akron Roundtable. So we're excited about that. And then finally, um, Sam will give a keynote presentation uh, at the Akron Public Library, and then he'll do a book signing there. So books will be available, in fact, both at the Akron Roundtable as well as the library in the evening. And Sam will uh, go ahead and um, sign any books for anyone that would like. Awesome. And one last time, where can people go to find all of the resources for your nonprofit? So go to cover2.org. That's cover, the numeral two, dot org. Greg, and thank you so much for sharing your story, your time with us, and for all that you do to bring education and awareness about opiate addiction here to Northeast Ohio and beyond. I, I applaud what you're doing, and I hope that we can implement a quick response team.